It's 9 o'clock. Nice to see everyone here so bright and early this morning. Although you're moving, what's going on? This side, there's more people on this side than on this side. <laughs> that side didn't show up. Bad side. Just tell people on your side that they're bad. We're the bad side. It's all right, I guess I'll forgive you. Most of you on this side. <laughs> You're farther away from the slide, so I think it makes it even weirder. <laughs> All right. On. So let's, we're going to today finish up Hindley Milner type inference today. So, what is the goal of this Hindley Milner type inference? What do we want this to do? What's our end game? Check types. Are we checking though? I mean, we are. Well, it's so that you don't have to necessarily check. Exactly, yeah. So we are checking, right? That's We are checking types, but we're also inferring types. Right? So that's kind of the really cool thing, is we're inferring based on the usage of what the types have to be in order for the system to type check. Just like what you're doing in project four, you're not only doing type checking, but you're inferring the types based on the usage, right? You know if you see an integer plus a variable that doesn't have a type, then you know that that variable must be an integer, right? This is a lot more complicated because we have functions and we have array accesses. Um, we have a lot more kind of stuff here, but the basic core concepts are the same. Uh, so that's the goal. That's where we're trying to go is we want to try to understand and look at all types in the program to understand what could those types possibly be. So we've been going through each of the constructs in our language in order to see what exactly constraints that imposes on our language. Right? And this is you know, very similar to what you're doing again in Project 4. Right? We have the constraints of the, the language, and it's your job to go through and to enforce those constraints. Right? And if you get to a point where you can't enforce those constraints, then you know you have a type error. Okay, so I believe we left that function application. So we have a node, the apply node, which we're going to say is the function application. Uh, so we're going to say that has some type R, foo has some type F, and t1, t2, all the way to tk of the parameters are all types. So what are the constraints? that we can enforce on these types based on this function application. So do we know anything about, let's say, I don't know, x1, the type of x1? Do we have any constraints on that? I see some shaking, maybe nodding. That's oh, early. Neck muscles. Yes, why, why no? You're shaking your head no. Why no? Because I just thought no. <laughs> but why? Tell me why. Because it hasn't been declared anything yet. Foo has been declared, but not <laughs> x1 or x2. Yeah, so, right? So x1 and x2, they're just parameters into this function, right? We don't, at this point, they could be anything, right? They're just parameters being passed into a function. We don't know exactly what those types have to be. It's not like we can say they have to be an int, like on array access, right? So what do we know here? What do we know anything about? Let's say the type of foo. Yeah, it's a function. It's a function. Yeah, right. So it seems kind of trivial, but that's actually the little piece of information that we're going to build upon, right? So f is a function. So what's the type of that function? This function, the type f. What's the type f? Is a function of what? T? There aren't any T's though. We have R's, F's, and T1 through TK. Return type R, definitely, right? So we know that. So we know that whatever foo returns must be the same as this type R of this apply. Right? So we know foo is a function. How many parameters does foo take in? K, K number of parameters. Do we know the types of all their parameters? Not exactly, but we know they have to be t1, t2. They have to be the same as these, right? So we know that f, foo, the type f is a t 
type of a function that takes in t1 through tk and returns type r, whatever r is. Right? And so maybe, hopefully you can kind of see where we're going. We're going to build on these. So we're going to see that, OK, if this r apply is used to add to an integer, then we know that foo must return some integer. Right? So it's not going to be just general type r. OK. Now we get to function definition. So now here we're defining a function. So here we have our uh, function. And so we're defining now these x1, x2, all the way to xk, right? These are parameters of the function foo, right? So we're going to give them types. We're going to call them, we'll give foo the type f, all the types x1, x2, xk. And we'll say that the body, right, is some expression of type e. Right, so then what does this constrain the types that we have here? So first thing we'll say that the a function definition doesn't return anything. Right? There's no type there. It doesn't really make you could do it like that, and I think some languages do, but we don't have to worry about that for right now. Right? So these types E, F, T1, T2, TK, what's the relationship here? The type of E, F must return something of type E. And we also know, just like before, exactly the number of parameters to F. Right? We know that F, it, the type of F is a function that takes in T1, T2, all the way to TK, and returns a type E. So one of the cool things is, well, let's not get into that, but uh, based on this definition, right, if we decide that E is, let's say, an integer, and we see later that this function foo is being called where it expects a string to be returned, right? We can say that there's a type error that can't possibly happen. Okay. If expressions, so how's this different than a normal if statement that you're used to thinking about? What do I mean by expression versus? Say it again. Expression has to have some kind of property. Yes, yes. Expression has to, you can think of return something, right? It has some kind of return, whereas a statement can just be a side effect that doesn't return anything. Right? So here, the way to read this is if this condition, then return expression one, otherwise return expression two. Right? So the if condition actually returns something. So here we're going to have. We're going to write it as, OK, the if is a t4, and then the condition is a t1, the expression 1 is a t2, expression 2 is a t3. So then what are the constraints here on these four types? What do we know has to be true about these types? t1 has to be a Boolean. t1 has to be a Boolean, yeah, exactly. What else? Why? T2 and T3. Because if they're both returns, they have, they have to be the same because it has to expect the same output, regardless of which condition it, it takes. Right. So yeah, you don't want your program to be typed differently depending on what path it takes to the program. Right? If you go down one branch, then it's going to return an int. If you go down another branch, it's going to return a string. That's not going to be that's not going to be what you want in the type system. So is that it? What else do we know? T1 has to be a Boolean, right? The condition has to be a Boolean. And then all of these types have to be the same, right? Whatever one branch returns is the same as the other branch returns is the same as what the if statement returns. Cool. Any questions on this? All right. So these are actually the only rules we're going to talk about and focus on when we talk about Hindley Milner type inference. So this is something that you should. So You'll be expected to be able to perform this algorithm to be able to derive types based on a bit of code. So you have to either be able to reason your way to these constraints or memorize them, whatever works for you. And so what we really want to do, so we have all these constraints, and essentially what we want to do is we want to propagate them through the program, right? This condition, if this condition can be some arbitrary expression, 
right? Then we need to say, well, actually, that condition, that node has to be a Boolean, which means whatever, if it's a function application, that means that that function must return a Boolean. And if there's any parameters in there that are also used in other places, so we, we need some way to propagate the types essentially throughout this tree. And so this is this idea of type unification. So you're going to try to go through and bring together all the types uh, and try to find the most general type for every type in the program. So the basic idea is actually really simple. Uh, you start at the top of the tree. So you're going to have a parse tree, which is exactly what we've been looking at for those examples. And every time you see some construct with unconstrained types, right? every time you see a new type, so it says, hey, this thing is something new, right? then you create a new type. So you're just given a new T1, T2, T3, T4, right? some new anonymous type, which is also what you're doing in Project 4. right? When you see a new implicit type, you don't know what the name of that type is, but you know it is something new, and you know it's not necessarily the type of something else yet. So, and this is basically what you're doing. So you say, hey, if uh, a construct or in a tree, in the tree, right, if we say that, ah, this node must be type T1, and then it also later, by some other constraint, has to be a type T2, <coughs> and you say, well, then T1 and T2 must be the same type, right? These types have to be the same. And this is propagating these constraints, right? So you build these constraints, and you're going to propagate them through the tree in order to decide which types are, uh, what the types are for every place in the program. So let's look at an example. So here we have this function definition, right? So we have, so I'm going to number the nodes. So we have the function definition at the top of the tree. Uh, we have foo abc on the left. On the right we have, so what's, this is maybe a good test. So what's the, I don't know. I already said that. So it's the first thing that's going to happen, right, is the apply. So what are we applying to what? What are going to be the children of this apply? So what does this node represent in, com in relation to the definition? The body, yes the body of the function, right? So we're defining a function, the signature is on the left, on the right is the body of the function. So it's the, actually not the first, but the last thing that happens in this function. Calls function C. Calls function C with what as the argument to C? A or B. Was it A? Array B, yeah, so it's actually the array index operator, right? So the first parameter is the result of the array index operator, and what's the left child here? A, and the right child is B, right? So this tree, right, this is the parse trees we've been talking about, right? So this is first take A, use the array reference the operator, uh, sorry, take A, use the array axis operator using B as the argument here, then that value is passed into C, so we're calling function C and passing the result of this as the parameter there, and the result of that is going to be the, res the end result of whatever this function returns. Everybody get back? So now we need to try to figure out what are all the types for every single node in this program. Well, not only node, right? We want to know, okay, what are the types on all the nodes? Right? But what else do we care about? For defining a function, right? do we care about the type of that function? So what's the type of this function? It can be add. Yeah, we don't know yet, but we know it's the type of foo. Right? And what about the parameters of foo? Do we want to know those types? So, yep. Yes, it's part of the function type of foo, right? And maybe you can see they're also used here and here in the tree, right? So we should have types of those. So we're going to create a table of all the types. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to start <coughs> at the top here, right? And we're going to say, OK, at 1, right, this is a function definition. So what does that mean about its two children types, the foo and the apply? So does this apply any constraints on the types of A, B, and C? No. No, they can be anything. So we'll give them T1, T2, T3, right? So we, we see the parameters here, we see A, B, C, and we see, OK, we don't know exactly what those types are, so we're just going to give them new types, right? They're unconstrained. They can be anything. So what do we know about foo? <laughs> yes. So foo must be something, right? That but what does it take in as it's the types of its parameters according to the types that we've given out so far? Yeah, so it's going to do, let's say, t1, t2, t3, and return some type t4. Right? So then the other constraint, so if this is our type of foo, then what does this mean about the type of this node here? It has to be t4, right? So we know that whatever 2 returns, right, whatever that type of this 2 node is, is also going to be the return type of foo. Right? And we've said that in our type system table here by saying that those two types are the same. Cool. So have we successfully propagated the constraints? just did node 1, right? We propagated the constraints to all of its children, right? Now we need to recursively go to each of its children and apply constraints. We don't really go down the left. There's no children down there, and we've already applied all the types we need to here, right? So then we go to node 2. So what does node 2 tell us about its children, node 3 and node 4? Node 3 must return the same thing as node 2. But isn't this the function to be called? So what are the constraints on a function application? Four must be the same return type as three. Four must be the same. Ah, yes. OK, so we see this 4, right? So the first kind of one of the things is, okay, there's no constraint as to this parameter, right? This is a parameter that we're passing into the function C. Right? So we'll give it some new type T5. We don't know what it is. We're going to say it's some new type T5. Right? And then what do we know about the return to what one? T4. So why? Yeah, so we know apply has to be a T4, right? And we know that function C, right? Or actually, we're not even worried about the function C right now, right? We're just looking at this node, 3, because it could have children and a bunch of other stuff, right? So we're only looking at the nodes. So we say that 3 must be a function that takes in something of whatever is this parameter, which we just gave the name T5 and it returns something, and what's the return type have to be? T4, the same as node 2, exactly. So we're able to infer just by looking at this that node 3 is, must be a function that takes in a T5 and returns a T4. Questions? Ah, we haven't got there yet. Yeah, so we're doing it step by step. So uh, technically, you can actually do this algorithm, I think, any way you want. You can start from the top and go down. You can start from the leaves and go up. Uh, I like starting from the top down because I feel like that gives you a better anchor on like, how to actually do this. Um, but yeah, that's part of the thing is seeing that this is just, just like first and follow. It's a mechanical thing, and you're all, like, you can get tripped up if you try to look ahead and cheat ahead to see what's going on. So. Yeah, so that's why we didn't like change the type of C 
to be this right now, right? But when we visit node three, we're gonna do that. Cool. Okay, so we just did node two, so now we do node three. So what does node three tell us? Does it have any children? Does it have any constraints in that sense? No. No, no. but what does it tell us? Uh, what constraints does it have? Does it have constraints? Exactly. We know that. It, so we know that. Well, sorry. So we know that it's a node three, which means it has this type. T five returns T four. A function that takes in type T five returns T four. Right. We know that is type three. But what's inside that type? I mean, what's inside the node? C. What's the type of C that we have? T three. So what does that mean about the relationship between these two types? T3 and T4 are the same? Yeah. So you mean if T3 and T5. T3 and T5 are the same? No. <coughs> what must the type of node 3 be? Node 3? What's this type mean? It returns T4. Except for the T5 and returns T4. It is a function that takes in a T5 and returns a T4, right? This describes a function, right? So it has to be of type function. So wait, so T3 is a function that returns a function of T5 that returns T4? No. No, no, no. We'll get into that. Okay. Don't worry. Um, no, no. Right now, T5 is simply a function, any function that takes in one type and returns another type, right? Well, those types are T5 and T4. T3 is the constraint. Yes. Yes. The constraint says that these two types must be the same thing, right? We know that T3 has to be T5 returns T4, right? So we know that C, the type of this parameter C, must be a function that takes in some T5 and returns a T4. And what's that T4 in relation to this definition here? It returns value of the function, yeah. So this means the third parameter of foo is a function that takes in some new type C5. We don't know exactly what it is yet but it returns the same thing as whatever foo returns, right? So this constraint means that we're gonna replace all instances of T3 with the function T5. Um, so the function T5, uh, a function that takes in T5 and returns T4. So what's the difference between these two? These two types, T3 and that function, except T5 returns T4. It gives you more information, exactly. So let's think about it like this. Are there any constraints on what T3 could be? No, no. no there's absolutely no constraints, right? T3 could be anything. Are there constraints about what this can be? <coughs> In the place of three, can you use an int? No. Can you use a string? No. In the place of C here with T3, can you use an int or a string? No. Absolutely. No. Before that, oh. trying to get something. Right. At, at that point, it's anything. Anything, yes. This type T3 is more general than this T5, right? This function that takes in T5 and returns a T4. So that's why when we do this unification, we're going to replace T3 because we're trying to find. So the most general types for everything would be everything's completely un unconstrained, right? Your function foo. So this is the most general. Signature you could have for foo takes in any type any type any type all completely unrelated to each other and returns some brand new type Right, but this is more constrained right this says that Well the third parameter must be a function Right, so this is how we're moving from we're assuming that everything is the most general type possible and based on its usage We're going to restrict that 
So we say here, okay, we're going to replace all T3s with T5 goes to T4, or uh, the function that takes in T5 and returns a T4, right? Because between those two, that is the more specific function. So we're going to actually replace, we're going to completely get rid of T3. T3 no longer exists. So we're going to replace T3 everywhere with this function that takes in a T5 and returns a T4. So we're going to place it here, and then we're also going to replace it in our function definition. Does everybody see that we've now restricted the type of foo? Right? We're, we're subtly getting closer and closer more uh, towards the, more, the most general and most specific type that satisfies all the type system. I guess it's the most general general type that still satisfies the type system. There's a whole bunch of formalism behind this that we're not going into, so we should a little bit. Okay, so we just did node 3. Now we need to do node 4. So what constraints does node 4 have? What do we talk about? The array access operator. What was that? Yes, so which one, so it's going to be 6, right? So what does that mean the type of node 6 has to be? Has to be an integer. Oh, shit. I hate that I do these in opposite order somehow. Um, and so what does this mean about array 5? It has to be an array. Has to be an array of what? Type T5. Type T5, an array of whatever 4 returns, right? Because this array access operator is going to index and return a single element of this array. So the type of each element of that array must be the return type of the, the array access operation. So we know that from this usage that node 5 is an array of T5. And we know that um, node 6 is now an integer. So then we go to node 5, and we access node 5. Now what do we know about node, what does this tell us by looking at node 5? T1 is an array of <coughs> Yeah, so now we know that A, the type of A, which is T1, must be an array of T5. Right, yeah. Why is node 6 an N? Uh, this constraint here, the array access operation, so we have the constraint that anything that's used inside the brackets, like here B, anything that's inside there must be an integer. So we're doing array access based on integers. Okay, okay so now we look at node 5, right? Now we know, okay, A, which is T1, must be the same thing as array of T5. So which one of those is more specific? Array of T5. Array of T5, right? So now we're going to replace everywhere T1 with array of T5. So now we know that up here, the foo is now a function that takes in an array of T5, and a T2, and a function that takes in a T5 and returns a T4, and the whole thing is a function that returns a T4. Then we look at 6. Right, so 6 says that 6 is an int, and we know it's B, so we know those types must be the same. So which is the more specific type? Int. int. Yeah. So then we replace all T2s with ints. And now we've gone through and we've propagated all the types in this program. So now we know that foo is a function that takes in as its first parameter an array of something. The second parameter is an integer, and the third parameter is a function that translates from the type of that array to the return type of foo. So now once you have this, right, you can call this function foo by supplying any type of array, an integer, and then a function that translates from that type of array and returns some other type. Let's go over questions, though, before.
before we get into the into some examples. Yes. In mode one, we didn't write anything. Just curious if there has to be anything there. Because I mean, you figure that pretty well. I just don't know. Yeah, we didn't write anything here because for a definition, we don't return anything. We're never going to return anything for a definition. I mean, different languages actually do it differently. Where like. I think in JavaScript, uh, a function definition returns that function. So you could define an anonymous function, but assign it to a variable name. Um, so yes, you could have this would return basically the type of food. But we won't deal with that. OK. Let's look at what can happen when type inference, well, we'll just look at some examples. OK. So I'm going to find a function. You guys want to keep going with foo? Do you want a new function? R. Yes. The old standbys. <laughs> All right. All right, let's see. So I'm going to do. Draw the tree. So what's the topmost node of this tree going to be? Death. Death. And the left child? Bar. Bar. Mm. Yes. My tree drawing is not the best today. All right. And the right child? True branch, and then the false branch. types that I'm going to need to define? A, B. <coughs> yeah, A, B, and bar, and one, basically. So uh, we'll just do, I'll do one like this. All right. We'll do A, B, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We'll try to draw. Start at the top, right? We go to one, node one. What does this tell us about the types here? A is some type T1. Yeah, A is some new type T1, right? We have no idea what that's going to be. Uh, I'm just going to do it like this T1. And B is what? T2. Is it also a T1? Yeah, could, could be. be. Could be. Exactly, right? So that means that they have to be the same type, but at this point we have no idea if they are the same or are not the same, right? Because this, the definition has no constraints on those. Okay, and what's the type of, we're going to put bar here. Right, what's the type of bar or node 1? T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, T7, T8, T9, T10, T11, T12, T13, T14, T15, T16, T17, T18, T19, what do we know about node 2? It's also a T3. It has to also be a T3. Yeah. Great. OK. So are we done here? <coughs> Propagated all the constraints? Yep. Yes. Now we 
go to node two. Node two, we say, okay, what do we know about this if statement? What is what constraints does this apply to its children? Remember, we're not thinking about A quite yet, right? We want to say three, node three, exactly. Node three has to be a Boolean. What about node four? Four five has to be expressions. Have to be expressions? Yes, but what about the type? Four and five have to return the same type? Some type T4. T4? Well, but we, but node two has to return to T3, so its children have to return to T3. Yes. So, right? So we did this. This would mean that this type of T2, this type of node two, which is T3, can be different from these other types. Right. <coughs> Some language where you could add the No, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I mean, if this was C, you could have A, B, and end. Let's do what I want. I want to do this. Okay. <coughs> All right. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. It's kind of the problem with these things. Is it's really, really difficult to just tell by looking at it if it's going to type check or not, right? So you have to. Like you actually have to go through the steps. Um, okay, so four. Then we go to node four. So we just did three. We visit node four. What does node four tell us about the type systems? It tells us that T2 and T3 are the same. Oh, yeah. Yes, it tells us that T2 and T3 are the same, right? right. So are they both equally general? Really? Yeah. 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 But we still have to make sure that they're the same. So we just have to replace one with the other. So what's your favorite, T2 or T3? Yeah, T3, because there's more T3 still, <laughs> from a writing standpoint. So we're going to change every T2 in here to T3. Right? All right. Then we visit node 5. <coughs> so what constraint, so what, so node 5 is an addition operator. So what constraint does that mean that we used? So good, let's all review. Numeric type, we'll just say that they have to be the same. Okay. So what constraints then do we have here? Six and seven need to be the same. Need to be the same as what? T3. As T, as, yeah, as for node five, which is T3. Exactly, so we're gonna say these have to be T3s. Yes, okay, great. But we already know that that's so six and T3. We don't know yet. I haven't visited that node yet. It could be anything. It could be arbitrarily <laughs> long tree. Well, now we visit node six. <laughs> so now what do we know about node six? All T3s are booleans. Yeah. All T3s must be booleans. Yep. Yeah, so it says A, so node six is a T3, A is a boolean. So this means everything must be a boolean. Seven has to be a boolean. What's the type here? Integer. Integer. Can we yeah. merge those two? Unify those? Yeah, you can. But I mean, depending on your language. So we're using the same language as these ones and zeros for boolean operators. <laughs> yeah, the answer. Can be true or false? 
Yeah. Ones and zeros are one, zero and not zero are not good truth values, in my opinion. Does, doesn't C use zero and one? Yeah. No, it uses zero, zero and zero not zero. Yeah. Which is kind of ridiculous. I thought it was greater than zero. <laughs> huh? I thought it was greater than zero because if you put a negative one in, doesn't it stop? No. You have to check. <coughs> Yeah. No, no, no. It's just text. The if, all the conditions are if zero, basically, I believe. Uh, a lot of the return values are negative ones from a function. So the function fails. So a lot of when you call functions, they'll say if the return value is not equal to <coughs> negative ones. So like they do that check yeah. in the call. Um, so yeah, so then we get here. Then what do we say? Type error. Type error. Right? One is not a Boolean. Therefore, this program does not type check. <laughs> yeah, which type of the project? I'm just kidding, you don't have to do that right now. <laughs> okay, so that's an example of a type error. Let's look at something that's kind of cool. Okay. the tree, I'm going to just write the types on the nodes as we go to them, right? So, uh, okay, I can still number them. Well, let's number them. So why not? Okay. Great. Okay, so what do we know about this function? So now node 6. So we just did 4 or 5, right? Node 6. So what do we know about 6? What constraints does this apply to its children? So they have to return a t4, but this is a function application. 
Right, so what does this mean about node 7? It should be a function. It's got to be a function. So what's the type of that first parameter that it takes in? So we don't know, right? It's unconstrained. The parameters are unconstrained. So we'll just give new types to each of the parameters. And we'll say that C is a function that takes in what? A T5 and returns what? T4. T4. So now when we visit 7, now we know that C, so type T3, is a function that takes in a T5 and returns a T4. Right. Then we go to 8. When we look at 8, what does this tell us? T5 is an int. T5 must be an int. Exactly. So function C is a function that takes in an integer right, and returns some type T4, which is also the return value of this function pass. Then we get up here, and then we go to func to node 9. So what does node 9 tell us? A is a T4. Which means T1 is equal to T4, and T1 is an array of Boolean. This means T4 is what? Yeah, so now what's the type of this function VAS putting it all together? So is it type check? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're able to find based on this crazy usage, right, the types of everything in this this function definition of the. So yeah. So it takes an array of booleans and integer, and a function that takes an int and returns an array of booleans, and that function as itself returns an array of booleans. Could this be even crazier nested? Sure. <laughs> That's something I would probably do. <laughs> so young and optimistic. Cool. All right. Any questions on this? There'll be a homework on it. I'll probably assign it after the project core is due.